All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our fourth um, Free Speech Cafe. This is a program that is put on by We Talk here at Western Michigan. Um, and just for a quick overview, We Talk is a group, um, a kind of initiative that we started at, at campus of teaching people how to have difficult conversations about a whole range of topics. And so the free speech cafes are dedicated towards, as you might guess, free speech. And we pick a kind of a different free speech element each time to discuss. So the, um, the topic this time is where's the line, free speech protections versus legitimate threats. So as we know, not all speech is free. Um, and it's not, um, you know, so there's, there's lines here. And so that's what we're gonna talk about. So before we get into it, we'll just do some quick introductions. I'm Jessica Swartz. I'm the Deputy General Counsel here at Western Michigan University, and I'm kind of the free speech uh, contact on campus. Dr. Hurwitz? I am uh, Professor Mark Hurwitz. I'm a um, professor in the Political Science Department, and um, um, I teach the law classes uh, from constitutional law to civil liberties to judicial process. And for those of you who may be interested, this summer um, I'm actually teaching a course on the First Amendment. Um, so this will be a little bit of a precursor for that. So anyone who's interested can uh, talk to me if you're going to be here. It's actually an in-person class, so we're not going to do it online or hybrid. Uh, so we're going to go old school with that and go back to, um, so we're going to talk about the issues we talk about here for with speech. We'll also talk about, um, you know, religion and press cases as well. It should be a really good class. I'm looking forward to it. But that's me, and I'm happy to be here today. So thanks. And on the line all the way from Washington, D.C., we have Captain Karen. If you want to introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. I'm Michelle Karen. I'm captain with the Metropolitan Police Department. I work in the Special Operations Division, so we handle all the uh, First Amendment demonstrations, protests, uh, sometimes riots. Uh, in the District of Columbia. So I'm very excited to be part of this conversation. So Jessica, thank you for inviting me. Very, very welcome. We're very excited to have you as well. So let's um, go ahead and just before we kind of get it started, how many people do we have online, Emma? Just to... We have two. We have two people online. So it's not just us. Um, but before we get into kind of the meat of this, I wanted to ask you all a question, if you're willing to share with us. How many of you have participated in a protest at some point? Either just a march or, or, you know, signs up, great. And would any of you be willing to share your, some of your experiences with us, where you were, what the issues, you don't have to share the issue if you don't want to, um, and just kind of what it was like, would you be willing to share with us? Arizona. I lived there at the time, and it was against human trafficking. So we had a, a wide variety of people, a lot of families were there with their kiddos, and the purpose of the protest was to just bring awareness of how much trafficking there is in Arizona, because I think at the time, and probably still now, um, trafficking is really high there. So they wanted, we wanted to bring more awareness towards the community about how to stay safe, um, what we can do. So there were a lot of booths there that educated families on the resources nearby, and I really enjoyed it, and I got to learn a lot. Great. Was it peaceful most of yeah. the time? And it was okay. Okay. Were there police around? Yeah, there was. How were your interactions? Very positive. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. Michelle, can you hear her? Could you hear her? Barely. Okay. Barely. It goes in and out a little bit. So she was saying that she had participated in a protest in Phoenix um, against human trafficking. Yep. Yep. And it was a very positive experience um, and more of just awareness raising. Awesome. Good. Can we get one other person to share? One of you two be willing to share your experience? <laughs> Short. Um, I marched in Lansing for uh, women's rights. I marched for women's rights, um, both in Kalamazoo and other parts of the state. I've uh, spent a lot of years and never had that kind of time. Okay. And were they generally generally good interactions? Yes. Okay. Okay. So she was saying that she's done um, marched in Lansing and Kalamazoo on women's rights and disability rights and a whole other whole lot of other issues. So yeah. So with with a little bit of that background and just kind of knowing where where you all are coming from um, and knowing that there's maybe not everybody has participated in that. I want to do just a real quick general free speech refresher and and. Um, some couple, high level points here 
that in order for free speech protections under our Constitution to apply, there's a couple of uh, initial factors that, that have to kind of check the boxes for. So the first one is you have to be in a public place. Okay, there's no free speech protection in a private place. For example, the NFL. Okay, so that, that's a really interesting one that a lot of people, you know, don't think about when there were all these discussions about kneeling and not kneeling and all of those things compared to collegiate athletes at a public school, okay? So public, public place. The second um, element is it needs to be, whatever you're talking about needs to be a matter of public interest. So I can't go out and stand on the street corner with a megaphone and start yelling about my dog and think that I have free speech rights. Nobody else cares about my dog. It's not a matter of public interest, so it's not protected under the free speech um, clause in the First Amendment. So that's another thing to, to keep in mind. What you're talking about needs to be of public interest. And the third part, and this one, this one is much more nuanced, um, but you need to be speaking in your personal capacity. So a lot of times, and there was a Garcetti, called the Garcetti case, which actually came out of the DC circuit, as a public employee, when you're speaking as you're in your employment position, you don't have the same free speech rights as you would if you speak in your personal position. Okay, so the employer can come, including the government, can come and say, no, you can't say that publicly as an employee. So I can't go and say, I'm the deputy general counsel at Western, and I think this is absolutely ridiculous. Pick your issue, okay? What I can do is say, I am Jessica Swartz, and I am a citizen of Michigan and Kalamazoo, and I think this issue is absolutely ridiculous. So that is a nuance, um, and sometimes it's a blurry line, depending you know, if you've got a public figure. Um, but to keep in mind, that is the, the overall um, construct that we're working in here. And if you want to know more specifics about all of those, go back to our first free speech cafe last fall, and I go much more into that information. So when we're talking about freedom of speech um, and the right to protest and the right to disrupt, there's also kind of parallel tracks that we're thinking about. So we've got our right to free speech under the Constitution. At the same time, we've got state and federal laws that prohibit threat threatening people. True threats is what they're called. And the case law discusses true threats, how those are handled under the Constitution. But there's also the separate box, bucket, of how true threats are handled under the statutes of the states or the federal government. So a lot of the things that Professor Hurwitz is going to be talking to us about is true threats under the context of the Constitution. And these are kind of two different areas when you study the law. You've got the statutes or the laws, like what's in the book, and that's what the government writes. You know, a little separation of powers 101. And then you have the case law, which is the court interpreting the laws. So with that as a little quick primer on all of this stuff to give you a little bit of background, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Hurwitz to tell us kind of what the, the current state of the case law is. So thank you, Jessica. And again, thanks for having me here. Um, so I'm going to talk about the current state of the, of the um, case law. And that means basically I'm going to talk about Supreme Court cases on issues of free speech, particularly political speech and marching and protests and things like that. Um, and in particular, when they can lead to violence and when the government can protect itself and, th and things like that. So, um, you know, a lot of the issues that Jessica talked about, these are, you know, they're, they're real issues, but, um, you know, there's that sense of the two tracks, right? You know, you've got what the court's doing under the Constitution, then you have, you know, what the states and the federal government are doing in terms of the laws that are being passed, and then you've even got what's going on on the ground, right? And sometimes those things mesh and sometimes they don't. There can be some disconnect on that, right? And uh, so the on the ground part, that's why we have Michelle. She's gonna be here and talk about that and I'm looking forward to hearing that too. So what I wanna do now is start with kind of a quick and dirty Supreme Court case law review. Um, and uh, the Supreme Court's been dealing with these cases uh, for a while. Uh, interestingly, there hasn't been all that much new in this area for probably 40 to 50 years at this point. So we, uh, but um, 100 years ago through 50 years ago, um, 
this was an area of the law that was really hopping and the Supreme Court was, was, was doing it. So first of all, where do we get free speech from? Well, it comes from the First Amendment. Um, and the particular part says very specifically, Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech. So that's where it comes from. Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech. And realize that it's not just Congress, but that's been applied to um, the state governments as well. So the states are not allowed to make laws um, abridging freedom of speech either, which means basically that we as individuals have free speech rights, um, except that Congress does make laws all the time abridging freedom of speech. In fact, they started as soon as the, as soon as the country got, uh, got going with the Alien and Sedition Acts. I mean, literally just in, you know, in, in the first few years of, of, of our country's uh, um, existence, we started to abridge freedom of speech right away. Um, so the question then becomes, because there are a lot of laws that do seem to limit freedom of speech, which laws are valid and why. And in the end, it comes down to context. Context is really going to be the biggest uh, issue. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, today. So, uh, and I don't wanna take up too much time here. So, but realize this, freedom of speech is at the hierarchy of all freedoms. The Supreme Court said this over and over again. Um, uh, and, and in fact, uh, uh, I'll give a famous quote from Justice Holmes. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes was a famous Supreme Court uh, justice 100 years ago. Um, and this is a quote from him. If there is any principle of the Constitution that more imperatively calls for attachment than any other, it is the principle of free thought. Not for those who agree with us, but freedom for the thought of that we hate. And that's the key, right? Okay, it's easy to protect speech that we like. The hard part is, are we going to protect speech that we don't like? And that's the linchpin to freedom of speech. And that de doesn't depend on what you like or what someone else likes. If it's gonna be true freedom of speech, both of you should be agreeing on the right to speech irrespective of the content, okay? Because, uh, um, you know, content regulations are simply put invalid. Um, but it turns out that, you know, sometimes on the ground, the content matters. But anyway, that's the point. We wanna protect speech whether or not we like it or hate it. So what about this? This comes down to this issue of when can the government um, deal with the fact that there might be a true threat out there. Um, and there was a case um, about 100 years ago known as Schenck against the United States, where the Supreme Court tried to balance these issues of threats and speech. Um, and they said, basically, they came up with this idea. Uh, and this was a case that was written by Justice Holmes. He's, he's very much at the forefront of pushing uh, what happened with freedom of speech. He said, the government may suppress, meaning limit speech, when it represents a clear and present danger a clear and present danger. That was the language that they used. And that could be a clear and present danger to society, it could be to the government or whatever. Um, and we've all heard this saying, but this is where the saying came from. And this is another quote. The most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. All right, we've all heard the phrase, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater, unless of course there's really a fire. Okay. Um, that's where this came from, right? Um, and of course, that's not a public issue as well, too, which, but, but the point was not all speech is, is, is protected, right? The other part that's important besides the um, clear and present danger part that comes out of the Schenck case is the Supreme Court said very specifically that the federal government has a right to defend itself, has a right to protect itself. Um, and that's a really important issue as well, too, right? In other words, um, you know, the, the government does not just have to put up with, with all threats. They can actually, uh, the government uh, can defend itself. And that comes up over and over again. And I think that's going to be part of our conversation as well today. Okay, so the next case is a, is a similar one, same year, 1919. This one is known as Abrams against the United States. Um, and this was a case that looked a little bit more specifically at the distinction between actions and words. Um, words are going to be protected. Actions, taking matters into your own hands, particularly from violence, particularly if that language is intended to produce action, um, then all of a sudden the action itself isn't protected, but if it looks like the words are going to lead to action, that's where the government can suppress that as well too, okay? 
Um, so there was some disagreement on the court about exactly whether or not the words in this case uh, presented a clear and present danger. Um, but, uh, but, but the issue there was that distinction between words and action and what's gonna be protected. Um, and these were cases basically that came out of uh, World War I. Jump ahead about 30 years and we're now in a new war. Um, that war is known as not World War II, but the Cold War. Whether that just got started again last night remains to be seen. But um, um, so we're in the middle of the Cold War. It's in the early 1950s. Um, and the Communist Party in the United States is um, acting in a lot of ways. And so there was a case known as Dennis against the United States. Um, and the Communist Party in the United States at the time was advocating for the violent overthrow of the US government. And the Supreme Court held that that was a clear and present danger, that um, not just because it was the Communist Party, but anyone who is advocating for the violent overthrow of the, uh, of the government, that speech can be suppressed. And in this case, it was actually turned out to be criminal. They could be thrown in prison for it. Okay. Now, in some ways, the Dennis case uh, reflected the context of the early 1950s and Cold War faces, Cold War uh, fears. Um, um, but not all cases came out the same way. And the next case seemed to be a little bit different. Um, similar facts, uh, this case is known as the uh, Yates against the United States in 1957. Um, and here there were people who were not necessarily teaching the violent overthrow of the US government, but they were Communist Party members who were discussing the issue of how do we overthrow the government? How do we bring a communist revolution here? And it turned out that was protected. So what was the difference between the Dennis case and the Yates case? And in the end, again, here's where context matters. In the first case, the 1951 Dennis case, the ones who were advocating for the violent overthrow were leaders of the Communist Party. Right? So they were the ones who were actually trying to bring their members out to say, we want this to happen. As opposed to the, um, uh, the Yates case in 1957, where it seemed those were more just people in a room talking. Okay, about it. They might have been, you know, sending messages back and forth and things like that. So there was the distinction between the leaders and the followers. And the followers thinking and talking about overthrow of government was different than the leaders um, actually trying to advocate for it. Okay, so again, context matters. All right. Then we come into the 1960s, and this is where we get um, some of the last real um, words uh, on this part of, fr of freedom of speech. And one happened to be a case known as uh, Edwards against South Carolina. This was a case that was about uh, civil rights marches going on in the early 1960s in South Carolina. Um, and uh, basically what happened was, you know, it was a civil rights march. Uh, it was at the state capitol in South Carolina. Um, and um, uh, basically everyone was arrested just for simply going onto the state capitol grounds and, um, uh, and, uh, and, and protesting uh, in favor of uh, the civil rights movement at the time. And basically the Supreme Court said that um, the Constitution um, did not permit um, a state or a federal government to make criminal what they called the peaceful expression of unpopular views. Well, what were the unpopular views? The unpopular views were pro-civil rights movement in South Carolina in the early 1960s. Okay, again, context matters, all right? So this was unpopular speech in South Carolina, but it was protected speech, okay? And then finally we get to the case, which is basically what's going to, uh, going to drive the rest of our discussion here today. And that's the case known as Brandenburg against Ohio. This was in 1969. And this is the case that basically sets out the standard for when the government can, uh, can suppress speech and when it can allow speech. Basically, this was a similar kind of protest uh, as to the, uh, the civil rights one, only this one was on the other side. This was the Ku Klux Klan uh, that, was, uh, that was basically talking about um, you know, having rallies and marches and all sorts of things. And the Ku Klux Klan, um, you know, it's not just in the South. This were here it was in Ohio. For those of you who don't know, Ku Klux Klan actually got started in Indiana. There's a real history of the Ku Klux Klan uh, having uh, a lot of support in the North as well, not just the South. Um, and, uh, and, and basically, what happened was um, the leaders of the Ku Klux Klan uh, were, uh, were arrested and they had a trial. And the trial judge did not sufficiently distinguish between advocacy 
and incitement. In other words, it's one thing to say we need to rally. It's another thing to incite violence. And because they didn't do that, the, um, uh, the uh, convictions were overturned. And here's the standard the Supreme Court came up with. They said that the government cannot forbid advocacy or law violation except when, the, when there's inciting imminent lawless action and it's likely to produce such action. So let me say that again in a little bit, change the negatives that the Supreme Court said around in there. States can forbid advocacy of force and violation when the speech is inciting imminent lawlessness and when in fact it's likely to produce such action. So those are the key, that, that's the linchpin there, right there. Um, you know, is it going to incite imminent lawlessness, not lawlessness, you know, a week or six months or whatever it is down the road, but is it imminent, okay? And is it likely to produce uh, that action? Then the Supreme Court can suppress it. Otherwise, there is protection for people to protest and to have their free speech rights, okay? And that's true both for leaders uh, and, for, um, uh, and for the lower level members as well too. So that's my kind of summary of what the Supreme Court's done um, in, in, the, in, in this uh, 50, 60 year period. This was when free speech issues were really garnering a lot of uh, time before the Supreme Court. And uh, in some ways I've gone through this chronology because you can see how the Supreme Court has evolved to a certain degree um, uh, because w basically what they were holding was the government could suppress speech back in, uh, in World War I. By the late 1960s, they were saying, no, that's the type of speech we're actually going to allow. Now we can jump ahead to current day and say, okay, that's the case law. As Jessica said, it's not just about what the Supreme Court's saying, um, it's what the states and federal government are doing in terms of the laws that they're passing as well, too. And I think you're going to talk about mm -hmm. the Michigan case law here in particular, right? So let me turn Well, I think um, we probably are going to go, I think, maybe to Captain Karen real oh, quick, okay. but there's a, just a couple of, um, to summarize all of that, right? Like what we care about right now is, is there, and this is relatively new, is the intent of the person speaking and the likelihood that it's going to happen. And so one, one of the, the examples that I use to summarize this when I'm doing my free speech presentation generally is it's the difference between standing out there and saying, let's go shoot Mickey Mouse and going to the flagpoles and say, meet me here at noon, bring your guns, bring your friends, and we're going to walk down to this address and we're going to go shoot Mickey Mouse. Okay, the first one of those is protected. The second one very likely is not. So that's kind of, you know, how you can think about it in your head. So Captain Karen has been, um, she was on the ground on January 6th. Um, she was also on the ground for the BLM marches and protests in Washington. And so we're hoping, or we know, she's gonna give us a little bit of the insight of that line. I mean, it's all well and good for the lawyers to sit here and say, this is what the law is but we're not the ones who have to deal with people up in our faces about stuff. Um, and so she's gonna talk to us a little bit about that and, and also kind of from her standpoint, from the police standpoint, where is the line? Like where, at what point do they start saying, you know what, we gotta do something here. So Michelle, take it over. I appreciate it. First of all, Mark, I need to get your class schedule so that I can join one of your <laughs> classes and just keep listening to you because that, the historical perspective of all that was very interesting to me. Anytime, uh, Michelle. I'm certainly Anytime. not an attorney. I'm not a lawyer. I don't profess to be one. Um, you didn't stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night? <laughs> was it, uh, yeah, I did. Actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> Two nights in a row, actually. <laughs> um, but I think that it's really important to have this dialogue because I also think that it's amazing when you have uh, law enforcement working with attorneys, working with those who are creating the laws, it's so much more important to have all of us working together. And that was one of the things that we did um, during the protests at BLM. We had the United States attorneys and the attorney generals, depending on, in the District of Columbia, there are, there are different um, offices that prosecute different, different crimes. And we had representatives of both of those that would come down when something happened and we would say, this is what happened, this is what we saw, and then we would have that discussion with them in reference to what crime may or may not be charged. Um, the, the standard 
that I have been taught for 20 years on MPD is that we pretty much, and we emphasize this all the time, you can come down and demonstrate in the District of Columbia as much as you peaceably want to. And that is very, very important. And, and the line of what is peaceable and what isn't is something that I think is part of the discussion here. Um, we did have, and I know everyone's seen the videos of people standing right in front of our faces and screaming and yelling at us. I mean, there, there was assaultive behavior of things being thrown at us, and I've been called all kinds of names, which has been happening for the past nearly 50 years, so that's no surprise there. But all that kind of stuff, those, those are different levels and different grades of what could be considered past the peaceable mark. But for us, as law enforcement, we also take into consideration resources, intent, um, it is, you know, how do we safely um, resolve this issue? And when people are just yelling and screaming at us, as fun, as not fun as it is to be called all kinds of names, it's just really not going to be something that we're going to expand resources on in order to, in effect, a, a, an arrest on one or two or three individuals. But when those things escalate and people are physically injured, uh, there's destruction of property, uh, things like that, then we have to start considering what, what the options are. Um, during those, I'd say it was probably closer to about a year worth of constant demonstrations, there were nights where it was riotous behavior and there were nights where it wasn't. And, we walked around with these individuals who wanted to yell and scream and do all these kind of things to us for hours. And it was fine because so long as they are vocally, peacefully voicing whatever their concern is, I'm all for it. Um, I've, I've protected uh, demonstrators from the Westboro Baptist Church. I've protected demonstrators from BLM uh, areas. I've, I've protected demonstrators who uh, are very right-wing protesters um, and the thing that we're taught constantly is that we remain content neutral and that is our line. It doesn't matter what you're saying to us, it doesn't matter what you're talking about, it doesn't matter what um, position you have, It's we'll, we'll be there with you. I mean, there was the March for Life in January, we handled, you know, it's probably closer to 50,000 people who marched from the um, small area up to the Capitol, and we sit there and ensure that they safely can do what they want to do. Um, so I think it just goes to kind of to what Mark was saying earlier, that the content of it doesn't give us any credence as to what we can or cannot suppress. It's content for us as law enforcement, at least in the District of Columbia, it's content neutral, and you can say just about whatever you want. Going back to what Jessica was talking about as far as having intent and then having ability, for us, you know, we take it to that level too. If someone's threatening you and, you know, uses something like, um, oh, I'm gonna F you up, it, it, I don't know. For some people that's threatening, for some people it isn't. Now, if that person says, I'm gonna run up to you and punch you in the face, but they're in a wheelchair and have no capability of running towards you, then maybe that threat isn't a viable threat based on those um, circumstances within that incident. So those are all things that need to be considered when we talk about levels of, of threat and, and how those work towards uh, the laws in DC. So I don't know if that's enough of a sort of overview, Jessica, but that, that's kind of where, yeah. where to... No, that's great, thank you. And, and Content neutral thing is really key because we as a university, as a public entity, that's where we are as well, is we have to remain content neutral and no matter, unless and until it transfers over to your threat situation. Um, and it's because we're the government, right? And so you don't want the government coming in and telling you what you can or cannot say and you know, where would you draw the line if, if you are us you know, where would you say, okay, Western, you can tell these people to stop talking, but you can't tell those people to stop talking. We don't, we don't do that, right? As long as it's safe, physically safe, um, we're not gonna get involved. But one of the questions, you know, for you, Michelle, is can you tell us, like, describe a situation where it switched? Like your experiences of, okay, 
this is peaceful. I may or may not agree with what they're saying, but they're, they're doing their thing. They're being peace. And then, all, and then it's like, you know, uh, this is getting a little scary. Can you, if, you know, what is it, a situation where you did that and like what was your thought process and, and what is your training in those? Yeah, I mean, uh, in 2020 and uh, the early stages of 2021, that was something that we dealt with a lot. Um, like I said, in the district, we handle protests and demonstrations on a daily basis. And for the most part, they don't have us think about the trigger as to where it stepped over. Um, when the BLM um, plaza was sort of uh, developed, and um, we had certain areas where we kind of said, you guys can stand here and talk and yell and scream and do all you want, as much as you want, but this is an area where we have to protect, mostly just to make sure that there was safe passage for other people. So, you know, you can sit and protest and yell and scream and all that, all that you want, but I, there are actually people in the District of Columbia who just want to walk through, who just want to get to their job, who just want to get to the store or whatever. And so it's um, important for us to ensure that those people still have those abilities to do that. Um, so we would make sure that they had what we call sight and sound so that they could air their grievances. And generally speaking, at that time, they were airing their grievances at the White House. And so we let them have 16th and H, which is the intersection. For those of you who don't know the geography of DC, I apologize. It's just north of the, Washington, of the White House. But we would allow people to be able to walk on the south side of it so that they could get through. Um, there were nights where they would yell and, I mean, we had people putting lasers in our eyes. I have a couple of people who have damaged um, eyesight based on the fact that people were shooting lasers in their eyes and stuff like that. But that would, I mean, it wasn't even sort of the impetus for us to have to go forward and start um, making arrests. What really was, was when they were throwing bricks and um, there were balloons that they were throwing with urine and antifreeze um, and things like that. Once it started becoming assaulted behavior, we were like, oh, no, 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 we, we can't allow this anymore. And that's when we start trying to develop strategies and tactics to go and, and try to arrest the people who have done this. Um, and it happens both ways, you know, I, like we talk about content neutral, um, you know, the, the left side isn't any better or worse at doing that than the right side. And it was on January 6th, I'm sure you guys have seen a ton of video in reference to that as well. It was the same thing. You, you can stand there and yell and scream and say whatever it is that you want. And if you want to air your grievances towards the Capitol, you're more than welcome to. Once things start getting thrown or you start grabbing and throwing officers or uh, swinging poles and, and things like that at them, then that kind of flips over to the other side and now we have to work on strategies to, to mitigate those, those assault behaviors. So uh, one thing, um, Mark, when you were talking about the 1950s cases and the difference between the leader of the communists doing something versus the group of the people who are there, I of course thought of January 6th. And it, would that make a difference if they determine, and this is what the issue is right now that the courts are trying to, to figure out and everything, if they determine that President Trump did have, did instruct these people, and we know that's still an open question, and I'm not opining one way or the other, but if they do, do you think now in 2020, 2020 that would tip the needle the way it did in 1951, or have things changed in the law? So first we can talk about the President Trump issue. And of course he said years ago he could shoot someone on in fifth, broad daylight in Fifth Avenue in New York City and a jury wouldn't convict him. And I think that would be the case today. Okay, mm -hmm. that's still true. Um, but, but, the, but, but the bigger question that you're asking here is not so much about President Trump, but could a leader of that, whoever it happened to be, um, you know, what would, they be, what would they be saying when they would finally say this crosses the line, okay? Because we know there was violence on, on, on uh, January 6th, okay? Um, so, um, you know... And we um, know that he didn't physically walk them up there. He stayed where he was, you know... He stayed where he was. He said, let's go, let's right. walk there. And then he went back into the White House, right. okay? Um, and there were other people who were the leaders who were doing it. And so the, the initial arrests... Um, that I noticed, at least that I saw about, was mostly leaders. Eventually they started going down to uh, others who were 
um, followers but had engaged in violence, okay? Um, and that's basically what it's about. Again, think about that, uh, the, you know, I, I know you're talking about the leaders and, and, mm -hmm. and the followers, that distinction, but I think where we have come now is to say it doesn't matter whether you're a leader or a follower. It's the Brandenburg uh, idea. Is imminent violence um, likely going to happen based on what you're saying? Um, and that's a little bit of a, of, a, of a guess, right, okay? Because um, let's say that, you know, Michelle and company, you know, and, and, her, and her police, they had come in on January 6th and prevented um, the marchers from marching from the White House down to the Capitol, okay? Um, there would have been a huge uproar about saying, you stopped us from peacefully protesting. Um, but, of course, what they would have done, and we know that now, is they would have stopped um, um, a violent, um, action. So where's the line, right? Okay, mm -hmm. because if, if they do that, if they prevent the violence, no, which and as the government, they're allowed to do that. And of course, it's also, you know, this is an attack on the Capitol. So we're also talking about the government's ability to defend itself. They're allowed to do that, but then they would have been criticized uh, for moving in too soon and not allowing peaceful protest and maybe even content uh, violations as well, too. So it's a tough call, right? Mm -hmm. And, and um, so it's not as easy as just looking at what the facts are on a piece of paper and, you know, that, that a judge or a jury would look at. Um, you know, I try and look at it as well as people like, like Michelle are and saying, where is the line drawn? Okay, you can let people go pretty far. You can let them say a whole lot. But there is a distinction between speech and action, particularly speech and violent action. And I think that's what we're getting at mm -hmm. right here is did the leaders incite imminent violence? And, uh, and the question is, if they did, which leaders were they? Right. Um, and that's the question that um, needs to be answered. I don't know if we ever will uh, in this case because, uh, you know, obviously we all know about January 6th. We saw it. If we didn't see it happening, you know, in real time, we've seen the pictures a zillion times since then. And um, most people have retreated to their corners and they believe what they want to believe and see what they, you know, what, what they think happened there for whatever it was. And so there are important questions to answer. I don't think we're going to, but those are the questions we have to ask. Mm -hmm. And if we want to get to the bottom of when speech is protected and when it crosses the line from speech to um, violence, which is unprotected, uh, where is that line drawn? Mm -hmm. So I do think we've come further than where we were in the 50s and 60s, um, but the standard's still the same. So again, just you know, looking for audience participation, you know, if you had to draw the line, you know, where would you draw it and why? You know, if you, and let's, let's bring it closer to home, we're not at 16th and H, okay, where we've got the White House, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and the Department of Treasury, and like all of these things, and like massive law firms and cyber companies and all this in one place. We're here in Kalamazoo, and we have the Proud Boys come, or a BLM march, both of which happened two summers ago, both downtown, and both resulted in some violent action. And both at the same time. Both at the same time, right, right, right on top of each other. So putting yourself in that position as a police officer on the ground and as city government, what would you do? Do you have any thoughts or ideas? Yeah. Well, I have a question. Mm -hmm. like an idea. So I, I'm wondering about like, the role of social media and the role of like, um, uh, communication. So I feel like, is there more room, say, to, to try to engage in type of foreign habits? Like, you are able to access like, a Discord server for this group, and you know, there's a discussion plan of possible action. If that is the case, if you have like a documented intent to be violent, then you move faster. Then, right. Until then, like before it actually is violent, if an intent has been expressed. No, that's a great question. So she, for those of you online, she um, asked about social media and, you know, if somebody, at what point, if you see something on social media, can you step in based on what the social media says? Um, and I mean, I'm going to let Michelle jump in in a, in a second. But here in Michigan, we've got a cyber bullying, cyber security, or cyber bullying law um, statute that says um, if you post something on a public media forum, again, right, this is the key. It's not a text chain just between you and your buddies. And this kind of relates to something, Diane, that we had worked on. Um, but it's, it's public. And 
the, the person posting it intends to threaten with fear of bodily harm or death, then under Michigan, with the intent to commit statute, and they posted it with the intent to communicate that threat, or with knowledge that it would be viewed as a threat, all of those three things, now you violated our cyberbullying statute here in Michigan. Now, that's a little bit different than, as we heard, the case law under the Constitution and how that goes. Um, but so, and I do know that some of the situations, we had a situation here a few years ago, there's the difference between seeing on social media um, a bunch of people are getting riled up, right? But they haven't really made a plan, they haven't really said anything specific, even if something bad happened the last time, right? You had a concert somewhere, bad things happened at that concert, those people now want to come here. Until, unless and until our police have information that it is likely that the people at the last concert are going to cause, come here and cause violence, we can't step in. Now, I will say that sometimes the university has to make the decision of which, and I don't want this to sound brash, but which lawsuit do you take? Do you take the lawsuit from somebody's parents because their child got hurt or, or you know, trampled, or do you take the lawsuit because you violated free speech, right? Both obviously very, very important, but that also for the university is what goes into the equation when making these decisions. But Michelle, I was gonna ask you, you know, from, from your experience, are you involved? Do you see the cyber, like the, the social media stuff? Are you more on the back end where the people said there's social media, you go? Do you, and, and what do you do? Yeah, so we, we have an office of intelligence who does monitor social media. Um, sort of in the case that's being presented here, I, one offs like that, if it's one specific person talking about it, generally speaking, um, it's not that we're not concerned about it, but that's going to fall in a, in a scale of what we have to really kind of focus on. Um, you know, the trucker convoys that are going on right now is a, is a great example of that, where there is a ton of social media being spun up around it, but there are, you know, there's one social media who has three followers and another one who has 10,000 followers. And I'm like, well, oh, Chances are good we should look at the guy with the 10,000 followers as opposed to the three, because even if three trucks show up, we'll probably be able to mitigate that. Um, so that's kind of how that, that works for us. I mean, if it's a specific case where this person says, you know, I'm going to do bodily harm to this specific person, we handle that as a violation of the law, and then our detectives would get involved with that. Um, but as far as speech where it's like, we're going to get together and go protest, that is something that we, we pay very close attention to, and we have people who, who do that. Thank goodness, because I barely get off of Facebook, let alone do anything else more technical. <laughs> do you know what, I mean, more than what we've already said, like what is the indicator that, they're, that, the, that your folks look to to say, you know what, this is more likely that this might, ha beyond just how many followers, like are there indi uh, indicators of, there's some intent and there's likely this could happen versus these are just people who are angry and have a right to be angry and we're not gonna, you know, bother them. Yeah, I mean, it's a multi-pronged approach, right? So it's not just about the, the post itself, it's not just about the type of platform or how many followers they have, but then the commentary that's coming through on that. And then, you know, other things that, that may be indicative, it, it becomes, you know, newsworthy, and then main news channels are starting to talk about this type of protest, and that sort of uh, lends some credence to it. So, as different things sort of start revolving around, if it's a singular post or a platform of posts, we start paying a little bit more attention, and then that becomes our discussion, um, which we have all the time now, about are we going to deploy, you know, one uh, group of people, are we going to deploy half of our department? Are we going to have the whole department activated, um, which we've had to do several times. I, right before BLM, well, when BLM happened, uh, when, right after George Floyd's murder, um, it was, I think, May 31st, I think, we did a full department activation. 
That was the first time that had occurred since 9-11. So it shows you how few and far between these events have happened. And I can tell you we've done a full department activation in the past year and a half, probably about half a dozen times. So it's definitely ramped up the amount of uh, protest and, and vitriol and violence that, that's coming um, to the nation's capital has definitely escalated dramatically. So we do pay attention to all that kind of stuff. And one of the interesting things about D.C. too is, um, I think, what did you say, there's 13 overlapping jurisdiction police departments in the district? 30, 30. 30 overlapping police departments in the district. You know, so trying to figure, we, we think it's a little confusing here with DPS and KPDC or what, you know, the Kalamazoo police. Um, but yeah, they've got 30 different individual police jurisdictions that they're, yeah, you know, and federal and, and federal right, and local, state. Educational. Right. Um, but like we had discussed before, 1600 block of Pennsylvania Avenue, everybody knows that's the address of the White House. On the north side of it, it is United States Park Police Territory. The sidewalk is United States Secret Service. The street itself is MPD. Like, it literally over a street that, and then, you know, south of that, it, it's right. amazing how the jurisdictions really are very intertwined. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. So if I could just add, kind of follow up on that question a little bit too, which is a little different, but it's a really important issue, um, and that is, you know, social media is here. It obviously wasn't here, you know, in the 1950s and 60s when the Supreme Court was, was deciding these cases. Um, so has social media changed the way we're going to look at these things? Because courts are really slow. They don't keep up, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, I mean, the, the Supreme Court finally decided a case on social media just a year ago um, uh, about a kid in a public school and whether her, her threat was real and did she, uh, you know, was it made, um, you know, um, you know uh, on, on the school campus and different things like that. And you could tell the justices really they kind of didn't get it, you know, a lot of it, you know, and, and, and so, um, so, but that's going to be a big issue, right? In, the, in other words, social, social media is clearly changing the game here. Um, so you've got law enforcement from at every level that Michelle's talking about to much higher levels. They're the ones who are looking at social media. They're the ones who are looking at um, online um, chatter, threats, all sorts of things like that. Um, and the courts, are not really dealing with it. And then they might come in here and there with a case, and it might be a really big case at some point, but it's a much slower process when with that happens. So that's a really important point that's a little different than I think you were asking, but I think it's something that's going to, to come up at some point as well, too. It's going to become important. Yeah. So in this case, is the definition of public shifting very, very quickly versus you know, a public blog post versus a private discourse server versus a closed Facebook group? versus an open Facebook group versus something on Twitter. And how, how is public being defined in each of these spaces as something that's, that's changing along the I mean, I would say so that our cyber statute was passed in 2016, right? I mean, it, there wasn't TikTok and all these things in 2016. I mean, it's changed so much. So it, it is evolving. And I would say kind of from a more theoretical um, separation of powers standpoint, we don't want the courts to be reacting like that, right? We want them to have all of the facts and to be able to take their time and evaluate the law. And we want everybody to have a fair chance when they finally get there with the evidence. And, and the founders did that on purpose. They don't want our society to be flipping back and forth the way it has in the last couple of presidential administrations, right? So this is where we need Congress to step in and because they can, theoretically, act much quicker or the states you know or the localities to define those because they're the ones on the ground who can go have the conversation with the police officers um, and the prosecutors and the defense attorneys and the judges or that i just said not the judges like and um so to answer your question yes it's changing it's changing drastically we don't really know um you have a bunch of us um, boomers and Gen Xers and Millennials who are still trying to learn all this stuff and how you know how how it works um, so yeah it's it's it really take the stress out of it it is a very interesting time right now um, and I see we, we've got 10 minutes left which is great I, I have a question that came in from one of our viewers online um, which is an interesting one so talking about again January 6th and this is for both of you 
um, the people who eventually got to the Capitol went past police barricades and they disobeyed the orders of the police and they you know, went into the building not considering those laws that they broke in doing all of that, because that is a very official, you know, specific thing. You got to listen to the cops. Um, how does that play in with their free speech rights? Once they went through the barricades, once they disregarded what the police were saying, do their free speech rights continue to be protected? Or have they now crossed into illegal actions are not free speech. And I just, you know, what do you, this is a tough one. This isn't like the drug dealer on the corner can't come and say you violated his free speech when he's trying to deal drugs, right? This is a very, a much deeper question. Just curious about what either of you think about that. I'm gonna let the good professors go first. <laughs> so the legal question is, uh, is the first one, um, were the police barricades where they should have been, mm. right? Because if they were um, in an area that was, um, let's say, too far away where you were half a mile from the Capitol, well, the Capitol is actually a public place. So, you know, you're allowed to get there. So maybe the, the police barricades were too far away. That would be a legal issue, okay? Um, of course, we have, uh, since 9-11, made sure that those barricades have gone further away because we realized that um, while um, uh, while the capital and state capitals may be public grounds, they're a little more protected than they used to be, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and for good reason after 9-11. After so that's the first question. Were the barricades where they should have been? Assuming they were, once they pass those barricades, now you're into, you know, where Captain Karen's uh, group is, right? Now I think you've crossed the line, especially if you've used force to get through. Okay, if you used force to move through, uh, whether you swung a pole or, you know, um, uh, you know, had whatever, you know, type of, uh, uh, you know, um, there were some weapons, there were some other types of issues that were used, or sometimes it was just brute force by a lot of people, th now you're talking about violence. And if the question is simply, you used violence to get in and now you're on the floor of the Capitol, um, can you just say, I'm here because, and then say whatever it is, is that speech protected? Um, I'm going to say probably not, mm -hmm. probably not, because you used too much violence and force to get through. You didn't obey uh, the police commands at that point, and it seemed as, as long as the barricades were in the right place and the police commands were legitimate and they were not content-based, then I think that's where you've crossed the line. I mean, I also, also say the floor of the house is not a public place. It's a, it, the, house, the building is a public place, but to get down on the floor, you have to be with a member of Congress. So anybody can't just go go walk down on there. Right. You used um, to be able to walk through the Capitol. You used to be but right. Yeah, pre 9/11, it's so. So I worked right. on the Hill pre 9/11. You yeah. could just you just walk through the metal detector and, and you're there. And now you have to go through the entrance and you have to like sign up and you have to show your ID and all. It's it's really amazing how different it changed. What do you think, Michelle? Yeah, I mean, again, when I talk about being content neutral, I really don't get to give my opinion about much of the stuff, but I think that Mark is, is accurate, and once you violate and go past that peaceably uh, you know, terminology in the First Amendment, if you're no longer doing it peaceably, then I think you can keep saying and using the screech that you want to, but you're going to be you know, placed under arrest at some point, and while we couldn't do it quick enough on January 6th, most of those people who are still trying to voice their free speech while inside the Capitol have been uh, taken into custody. So that, that's, I, I don't, I agree with him. I think once you use some type of force, you no longer have that protection. Yeah, and that's a really good point that Michelle just made because I, I used the one part of the First Amendment that said Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech. The next part of it says, um, nor shall Congress make a, right, uh, make a law uh, abridging the right to peaceably assemble. Right? And that's the key, peaceably assemble. Right? Um, you have to do it peacefully. All right? we, you, know, you have a right to peaceably assemble with people that you want to. Um, but when it crosses over into violence, that's no longer peaceably assembling. And I think that's where Michelle comes in. Yeah. So. so we have about five minutes left, and I know the three of us could just go on and on. I mean, <laughs> this is why we got into this line of work, um, is to, to learn and explore these areas. But I, you know, I want to hear from, from you all again. You know, 
if you have questions or is this different than what you originally thought coming in here? Um, have your, has your position changed? If so, why or why not? You know, throwing all of this out and, and the folks on the line too, um, please feel free to, to chime in. You know, we'd like to hear more from you. Yeah. So the, qu the question was, do we find it frustrating that the law has very amorphous adjectives, <laughs> you know, peacefully? What does that mean? Um, I mean, honestly, that's why I have a job, is because that is my job, is to figure out, oh, shoot, did we just lose Michelle? Oh, shoot. No, she's here. Oh, oh we can't see her anymore? Oh, there she is. Okay. Um, so th there's many layers to this. So while the statute and the Constitution, like the, con the way it is, the Constitution says peaceably, right? Okay, well now the statute, either the state or the feds, defined what peaceably means for them. And then it goes to the administrative level, so the Department of Police can define what does peaceably mean for them and give a little bit more detail. And then ultimately that's where the court, that's what the court's job is. So what I will do if somebody were to ask me that question is the first thing I'm gonna do is go look and see what the law, what the statute of the regulations say. And then if that doesn't do it, I'm gonna go and look at the case law and see, okay, what do the Michigan courts, how have they defined peaceably or peacefully? And um, that's why I mean, you may have heard, there's a lot of discussion right now about the Supreme Court re reversing cases and you know, there's the issue of the substance of the case, right? That's one thing. But the other one is we, again, our court system wasn't set up to change that fast. And we don't really want it to change that fast because if the definition of peacefully as interpreted by the court is this on one day and it's switched to that on, on another day, how do you as a citizen know what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do? So, I mean, your question is, yeah, anybody who is interested in that question should go to law school. <laughs> um, because that's what I do on a, on a daily basis. And in fact, when I was in law school, I remember having one professor where we were talking about a standard. I don't remember what it was. It could have been the undue burden standard. And that's a standard that goes, and most people know it from abortion, but it's, it's, it's actually endemic in the law all the time. And he called language like this, slimy language. <laughs> It's just slimy line. What does it mean? What's an undue burden to one person is not an right. undue burden to someone else. It's all relative. And that's where, as Jessica said, you have to go in and see how has this been interpreted? And that is, that's what we like, right? Mm -hmm. We enjoy doing that. Um, we don't get frustrated by that. That's actually the really interesting uh, part of it uh, for us. Um, you, know, to, you know, we get geeked up about it. What can I say? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but like I said, it is, from a public's perspective, if they don't know the nuances of the law, then all of a sudden they're not going to understand uh, what's being said here. Um, and, and, and maybe it's the communication of that that's the more right. frustrating part, but not the actual going into so, that language. Yeah, itself. so we're going to, uh, Michelle, I saw you had something you want to say? I was just going to say, because I mean, that question wraps perfectly into the whole We Talk Cafe prof uh, platform, right? I mean, how do you have that discussion? And that's sort of the point. How do you know what that word really means? It might mean something differently to me than it does to you. I mean, I have that problem just about every day when I have officers who are being yelled at about something and they want to do something about it. And I'm like, I understand that it hurts and it's not fun and it really is uncomfortable to listen to these people saying things to you, but they're still being peaceful because what they're saying isn't really a violation and it isn't violent uh, and it doesn't break the law and it's not fun and you know those are the thanksgiving day family dinner conversations that people have to have with each other and thank you for that question i think it plays perfectly into this whole platform of why we're here yeah yeah i do too so this has been great we really appreciate it i wish we could keep talking longer but um we've got day jobs that the three of us have to get back to 
um, <laughs> just want to let you know like, uh, that we have another event. Our next event is March um, 15, back here at 11 a.m. Um, and we're, that one we're going to be talking about money as speech. Um, and, and at what point, you know, does that cross the line and, and how much speech can you buy with money and, you know, um, so please join us for that. We've got a couple of really uh, interesting political consultants, one from each, one Republican, one Democrat, who are going to um, talk to us about that. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Michelle. It was so good to talk to you.